All right. So once again, good to have you. It's good to be together. Had a great year, exciting year. 2019 is going to be our best year yet. Amen. Oh yeah. I'm talking about what God is going to do. All right, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. I want to share something very simple this morning, and yet I hope you'll understand the profoundness of what I want to look at. Matthew 16, and we're going to read from verse 24. And <clears throat> what I want to share on the question that is behind what I want to share this morning is very simple. And it's this. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? What are you prepared to give, or what have you given in exchange for your soul? Now you listen as we go through it this morning, because we're going to discover that we've actually given away a lot, and we need to go and get it back. Okay? And where is our soul? How important is it? Matthew 16 from verse 24, we're going to connect, connect these verses together. Therefore, if anyone desires to come up to me, let him deny himself and take up his cross, follow me. We know that. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. And he, whoever loses his life for my sake, will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his holy angels, and then he will reward each one according to his works. Now, we have four verses there, and we have some very interesting comments. The first two we understand here in this church. But the next two. What does it mean to lose your soul? What will a man do in exchange, give in exchange for his soul? What does it mean to lose your soul? You can't, but it's a term. What does that actually mean? It means to exchange the eternal purpose of your soul for which you were born for something that is worldly. So when it says, what will a man do when he exchanges his soul, it means that he took what God gave him and God considers precious and he exchanged it for something else, something worldly. The soul, I'm going to explain it to you in a minute, was made for God. It was made to worship God. It was made to have fellowship with God. Yes? Now God asks a question here in this chapter. He asks a question. He says, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? In God's mind, he said here, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses it? So in God's mind, your soul, the soul of one human being, is of more value than the entire world. When God sees you and he sees who you are and he sees your soul, the value of your soul to God is of, is of more importance than the, the buildings, than the economies, and the than all the things, the natural things of the entire world that can be sold. He considers it of no value compared to the value of a human soul. And then he asks the question, as I have given you that value, I have given you that precious gift inside you, he asks the question, how can you exchange it? How, how can you, what will you give in exchange for it? I've given you something so precious that you have the right to lose it. You have the right to give it away. You have the right to exchange it. Then God asks the question, what can you give in exchange for what I have given you? But we do. We do. The state of our soul, here we are, is linked to the return of Jesus Christ. So it starts off in verse 24, it's talking about the work of the cross. Why does it put the work of the cross in, in connection with our soul? Then he asks in verse, chapter, uh, verse 26, he speaks of the value of the soul, and he asks what you can give in exchange for it. And then in verse 27, he immediately links this, 
your soul, the state of a man's heart, with the return of Jesus Christ. Important that it's there, isn't it? Now let's have a look. So our soul is linked to the, with the return of Jesus Christ. Come with me to Luke chapter 12. Simple story. Okay. From verse 13. It's a parable of the... Verse 16. The parable of the rich fool. The man who had everything, who planted everything. He had built buildings. So in verse 18 he said, And so he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for you for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Why does he speak to his soul in this parable? Interesting. Because he has made wealth and natural security the anchor of his emotions and his life. He said, I will speak to myself and I will say to myself, all these natural things, they are my security. I have no need of a relationship with God. He spoke to his soul and he said that. Okay? But God said to him, verse 20, Fool, this night, not your life, because it's part of it, but your soul will be required of you. Then whose will these things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. And God said to him, Tonight I am going to come and speak to you. God judges us on the condition of our soul. Tonight, he says, I'm going to ask, you're going to require you to come. I want to see your soul. Not your houses, not your land. He says, God judges us on the condition of our souls. And this man stood before God and he was spiritually bankrupt. So, let's go and look very quickly at a scripture we know and then I'm going to continue to expand it from there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Very simple, verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless until the coming or the returning of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Spirit, soul, and body. You've seen me do this before and you understand it. The three parts to us. The spirit is the God-conscious part of each one of us. That makes us different to animals. We have a spirit. Your soul, mind, emotions, and will. Mind, emotions, will. And your body is what you live in. It's your earth suit. Okay, so when we die, what do we do? We have a little zip. We go zip and we take off the earth suit and our spirit and our soul rise and go and be with the Lord. So the soul is you. It's your character. It's your personality. It's everything you are. Your body is not you. It's simply the vessel you are occupying at this time. Amen? I know we look in the mirror and we think that's me. You are simply, you are simply, you all drive different bodies like we drive different cars. You can have a nice car or a bad car, a poor car, an old car, but it's got nothing to do with who the driver is. Yes? And so your body is the same. God is not interested in your body. He puts that aside. He's interested in the driver inside the body, your soul. So now when I get saved, my spirit is reconnected with God. Boom. I am now a son of God. I'm talking to the Lord. My heart, my spirit is reconnected with God. But what about my soul? My mind, my emotions, my will, my personality, my character, 
What about me? Because God considers you very, very special. Hebrews chapter 4, what does it say? The word of God is quick and powerful. Sharper than any, any two-edged sword. Even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit. That means that when God speaks to us, he's going to speak to us in the area of our soul. He separates. The word of God will put aside the things of the spirit and he will deal with you. He'll deal with my mind. He'll deal with my emotions. He'll deal with my character. When God wants to talk to us and, and, and deal with our lives, he starts to get down to the real things of who we really are. So the word of God comes and it pierces my soul. So when we talk about what can I give in exchange for my soul, it means that we are trading things in our lives that are spiritual for natural things. I'm going to give you a little picture and then we come back to this. Imagine if I came to you and I gave you a bag or a packet, a little bag, a suitcase or something, and it had 100 gold coins in it worth a million American dollars. Just that alone gets us thinking, doesn't it? And I said to you, here's your gold, your packet with your gold coins in it. Keep this, for this is for when you retire. Just lock it up and keep it. When you retire, you've got a, you've got a million dollars in gold for your investment. You say, thank you very much, so grateful. Along comes a guy, and he says to you, and you have a passion. You have a passion for collecting things and a passion for souvenirs and stuff like that. And so a guy comes along, and he's driving a, nine, a 1955 Jaguar. And you think, wow, an old car like that. I mean, can you imagine me driving around town in a 55 Jag, or whatever, or a 65 Jag? <gasps> what would people think? And you take out a gold coin and you buy the Jaguar with one gold coin. You are so proud of your Jaguar. And, but you took one gold coin and gave it away. But now you've got to have something to fit the model of the Jaguar. So you go around and you look in the second-hand clothes stores and you find, a, you know, an old English cap and you find an old English jacket and you get yourself all dressed up and you give another gold coin for that. And so on and so forth. What you've done is you traded something precious for junk. That old car is not going to last that tweed jacket has already got holes in it. The cap, the next time you wash it, it's going to fall apart. You traded your gold coin for what? For junk. It was perceived value in your lie, in your eyes, but in reality it is just junk. And so we have something inside us that's our character. It's very precious to us and it's very precious to God. And what do we do? We exchange it for the world. We exchange it for what? The love of money? But more than that, we exchange it for unforgiveness. We, we perceive unforgiveness to be of great value because I want to keep it in my heart. So I can remind myself every day of all the people I need to be unforgiving to. I exchange it for pride. I, ex I exchange it for bitterness, I exchange it for anger, I exchange it for anything of the world, immorality, whatever it is. I exchange the gold inside me for something that is worthless. I'm giving it away. Now come with me to 1 Corinthians. In fact, come with me first of all to Titus. Where are we going? Uh, 
Okay? Chapter 2. For the grace of God, verse 11, that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. What does God's grace point us to? Point us to the cross, doesn't it? What does the grace of God say to us? Teaches us to do, to do what? To deny ungodliness. That word ungodliness is, is lawlessness. It's iniquity. The grace of God comes and He speaks to my heart and He points me to the cross and He says, I want you, you're about to get that junky old Jaguar and the junky old hat and the junky old cap, whatever you want, and the jacket. I'm telling you, don't do it. The grace of God comes and says, stop. You're about to take that gold coin out of your pocket, your bag, and trade it for that rubbish old car. And God comes and He grabs and says, don't do it. Put your hand back, put it back in your bag. And we respond like spoiled children and say, you don't understand, God, I like that old car so much, I could we spray it and everyone in town would see me, well, I want the old car. And the grace of God fights with us because we sometimes see the things of the flesh of greater value than the things of God. But this word ungodliness means lawlessness. In fact, it means it's the same root word as iniquity. You know what iniquity is? Iniquity is not sin. Sin is the things I do naturally, lightly in my body. Iniquity is what I premeditate inside my heart. Iniquity is something that's living inside here. Iniquity is where lust comes from. Iniquity is where murder comes from. Anger comes from. Iniquity is where unforgiveness comes from. Iniquity is something I harbor. I keep it deep down inside my heart. Lawlessness. The grace of God comes and He says, Don't buy that that iniquity with your soul. Don't exchange the richness of your soul for the rubbish of the world. Don't do it. But I do. Okay? Romans chapter 2. Very interesting little comment here in Romans chapter 2. Just a verse... Uh, verse 8 and then I go on to verse 9 verse uh, yeah. but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness indignation and wrath tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also to the Greek where does evil come from in our lives? Our minds, our emotions, and our will. It doesn't come from your spirit. It doesn't come from your body. So where does evil come from? It comes from my soul. In other words, I have exchanged part of the goodness of me. I've taken my life. I've taken the pureness of what I have, and I have given it away, and I have bought evil. I have kept it in my heart. That's why Jesus said if a man looks upon a woman and lusts after her, he's guilty of adultery. Why? Because he has bought something and he has kept it inside the inner chambers of his soul and he meditates on it and he turns it over until it's, until it's going to produce something. Where does it come from? Evil lies deep down inside my soul. But it wasn't there before. It means that somewhere I took of what is precious, my character, and I exchanged the good for the bad. What lies in your soul? What lies in your heart? What lies deep down inside that people can't see? That's why in Matthew 16, what did Jesus say? He who loves his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. He's talking about my soul. I am willing to take my soul and the, the things that God gave me, my personality, my mind, my emotions, and my will, and I allow them to be corrupted by the cheap things of the world. I'm willing to sell myself to the world for those, those momentary attractions from which may, I may not recover, and I've exchanged what I had that is pure for something that is ungodly. 
because I love the world. And by loving the world, I lose my life. But when I keep my life for Christ and I die to self and I die to what is out there, I don't actually lose, I gain. Amen? Your soul. What have you exchanged? The riches of your soul, what have you given away? Now come with me to 1 Corinthians. Let's have a look at this little verse here. From verse 11. He speaks of a foundation. It says, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Chapter 3. In this church, you should know what chapter. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test everyone's work of what sort it is. Now, if anyone's work which he has built endures, he will receive a reward. But if anyone's work is burnt, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, so as by fire. So the foundation that we build our lives on is Jesus Christ, my salvation. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That is the foundation. Now Paul is using another picture, he says. He's using a little picture of how we go through life and at the end of our lives, God takes the accumulation of everything we have done and He puts it together as though we have built a building. All right. So every hour of your life, God gives you a little brick about this size in heaven. Every hour you live is an angel laying a brick. A brick of what? He looks not at what you've done, he looks at the state of your heart. Oh, for the last hour we've had anger and resentment and bitterness and all the rest. Let's cast a brick of straw down there. The next hour, another brick of straw, because it's worthless. Next hour, another brick of straw. Now, after 30 years, I've got a straw house. It's worthless. So when I stand before God, Jesus comes, and, or I die, and I stand before God, God says, let me show you now the sum total. Your soul will be required of you. All that contains in your soul, the richness of your soul, everything that you are, your character, your personality, your walk with me. Let's have a look at what's left. 90% of it is wood, hay, and straw. It's worthless. I started off with a bag of gold and I've got one half a coin left. Because I gave it all away. I gave it away to the world. I gave it away to anger. I gave it away to bitterness. I gave it away. I traded the things that are precious and holy to God. I traded them for useless junk that has no value in heaven whatsoever. And when I stand before God, I've got nothing. What will you give in exchange for your soul? What have you given already? How much of your life have you lived to this moment? What are you carrying inside your heart? What you, the way we are living, the way we are thinking, the way we are, we are responding. What is in my heart now that if God looked and he, and, he, and he called me home right now, how much of it would be considered wood, hay, and straw? The work of the cross... is to remove the flesh and the world from my soul. When, I, when God speaks to me, whether it's through the Holy Spirit, through His Word, whatever it is, how does He speak? In Hebrews it says, His Word comes in and He separates the soul and the spirit. In other words, He exposes my heart for what it really is. Yes? The Word of God comes in and He touches, He puts aside the things of Jesus, the spiritual side, and He looks and says, Whoa! When I see that, I see straw. What is straw doing in my house? 
What is unforgiveness doing in my house? What is worldliness doing in my house? What is it doing here? Why is your soul attached to these things? Why are you selling your soul, taking your life and actually giving it away, paying with your life for those things that have no value? Then he says, that's why he says, if any man wants to follow me, what must he do? Pick up his cross, deny himself. Because the Holy Spirit comes and he says, stop, stop. What does it say in Galatians chapter 5? It says, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the Spirit fights against the flesh and the flesh fights against the Spirit. For these are contrary one to another. That means that the Holy Spirit in me is saying to me when I cast my eyes on those worldly things, He's saying to me, no. No. And that obedience is called death. We think we are dying. In fact, we are living. Our obedience is what we think is dying. When God says, no, I agree with him. I say, Lord, I am willing to lay aside the world. I am willing to die to the world. I am willing to give back to the world what I bought from it because I don't want it anymore. And I'm willing to embrace Christ. That's called dying. I don't know why they're called dying. They should call living. But we say die to self. It means I'm dying to the rubbish in my heart that I may serve God and find purity. I may get back the gold. It's like I go to the owner of the car and say, here, I discovered it's a bunch of junk. Keep your car and give me back my gold. Yes. And go back to the, to the end and bow and say, you can have your hat and have your jacket. Give me back my gold. Huh, you wouldn't get it back here, but anyway, you can try. Repentance means I'm going to get back the gold. Do you understand that? Repentance means I'm going to see my state and I'm not going to harbor it in my heart and I'm going to take that, that, those blocks of wood and hay and straw and I'm going to throw them out and I'm going to come before the cross and I'm going to humble myself until my heart is broken before God and I find righteousness again and gold comes back in my life. My soul is well in the presence of the Lord. What have we exchanged God's righteousness for? Look here. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 5. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will bring to light the hidden, and, uh, the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each man's praise will come from God. <laughs> when Jesus comes back, he's not going to ask you what church you belong to. He's not going to ask you how much money you gave. He's not going to ask you what you did in the church. He's not going to ask you any one of those things. He's going to open the box of your heart and look inside and say, I see the counsel of your heart, the inner thoughts of your heart, the things that, you, that you've hidden in your heart. That is what I want to have a look at. that your soul it's you your mind your emotions your will your character your personality it's you we hide that we hide it behind how we live we hide it behind our meditations you know when you go to, when you walk down the road and you go to bed you daydream all the time and all the wicked things you daydream about that's you why do you daydream about it because it's you. It's who you are. It's what attracts you. It's what's important to you. That's what you're going to give to God. Imagine saying to God, here are all my daydreams. Woo. <laughs> my future reward in heaven is based upon my daydreams. Guys, don't go there. Because we're exchanging the things of God for rubbish. Matthew 25. Matthew 25, the story of the talents. I'm telling you, ask yourself a question when you read these stories. Why is this chapter in this place in the Bible? 
Why is Matthew 25 after Matthew 24 and after the story of the foolish wise and foolish virgins and just before Jesus died? It's right. It's one of the last things he taught. And the talents are not our gifts, by the way. You see, I have a talent from God. I can play the piano. It's got nothing to do. Don't misread your Bible. The talent is the English it's an English, can I say, mistranslation. The talent is not something I have from God. It is, in the story, it is something that belongs to the owner and he gives it to the servant to take care of. That's what it means. He went to a far land and he took, he took his possessions. He said, look, I have, I have, a, hundred, I have a bag with a hundred coins in. Will you take care of it? Got a bag with five coins in. Will you take care of it? Got a bag with one coin in. Will you take care of it? It's my money. It's my bag. Will you look after it? it doesn't belong to you. It's mine. That's what the story says. In other words, what are we doing with the precious things of God as Christians? How am I taking care of the kingdom of God and the things that are pleasant to God and what God has asked of my life? How am I taking care of the things of God? It's not about me. When we die, he says, let's talk about what I gave to you that is mine. The grace I gave to you. The anointing I gave to you. The revelation I gave to you. The things that are mine that I left with you to look after. I'm not interested whether you can sing or dance or clap or jump and turn around. I couldn't care. That's not mine. That's yours. What did you do with mine? Well, God, I know that you're a tough master. And you know, I knew you came back one day and what? So I just buried the kingdom. I buried your values. I buried everything. I just lived for myself. What have you exchanged your soul for? There's a reward when we die in heaven, when we go to heaven. Our reward is a responsibility. Our reward is what we have done with the things that are precious to God. When you stand before God, you don't take your church membership. You don't take anything that's natural with you. You take you. You. Without your body. In my case, good news. Yeah? I've emailed God at this. The new kind of body I'd like, you know? Have a few more muscles here and there. And then, you know. Some alterations. I leave my body behind. But I take me when I die. I go. And I stand before God. What do I present to the Lord? My excuses, my thoughts? No, me, my soul. How mature is my character? How godly is my personality? How pure are my thoughts? How much has my soul been washed in the blood of Jesus and how righteous has it become? Or have I traded it for the cheap things of the world? I stand before God and I offer Him all my worldly thoughts and all my worldly dreams and all my worldly desires and all my worldly attitudes. That's my soul. No, I have no reward. Wood, hay and straw. It burns in the presence of God as it has no value. Or is it gold and silver and precious stone? worked by the cross where he has put aside these things and day by day I've allowed Christ to be formed inside and I can say that I may know him the power of the resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings Amen what is our testimony I want to ask you what? do not not ask you, I want to make a statement do not exchange your soul for the world do not. You have no idea of how precious it is. No idea at all. We think we are buying, we fall in love with the world and all its rubbish and we think we have got so many precious things not knowing that inside there's a bankruptcy. We've been exchanging the precious things that God gave us 
buying rubbish with something that is super precious. Go back and give it away. Take the rubbish and give it away. And go back and get your soul. <laughs> go back and get what you lost. Go back and say, it's mine. I'm not going to give it away. I want it back. I want to give away my unforgiveness. You understand what I'm saying? I want back peace. I want back righteousness. I want back to be a person who is whole on the inside where Christ is the center of my life and I walk here in righteousness and I don't want the spirit of the world to own me. And when God speaks to you, where does he speak? In your heart. Amen. What do we do? We argue. When God speaks, what do you do? You justify, you wriggle, you argue. Why? Because I've done it myself a million times. I'm captain of the class. Yes. Because sometimes we don't see things the same way that God sees it. And that's not the issue. We must come to allow ourselves to obey the Spirit and see things the way God sees it, whether we like it or not. Because He sees more than we do. And when God starts to talk to us about these things, we say, yes, sir. And we humble ourselves in true repentance. And we clean the house. Yeah. We give back to the world what the world has and we, and we find back our gold coins and we make sure that when we retire, which means when we die, we have a full inheritance in heaven. What have you given in exchange for your soul? What lies in your hearts today? If Jesus were to come back now, oof, I would wish he would. I wish he would. Oh, it's a nice thought. Trumpet blowing. Boop, gone. No more fuel cues. Hallelujah. <laughs> if Jesus were to come back now, what would you give him? What in your soul would he see? That's the only thing you can offer him. Tonight, thy soul should be required of thee. God is a very righteous God. Do you understand that? He's a very forgiving, loving God. But when it comes to righteousness, he doesn't mess around. And that's why he speaks to us and talks to us. And that's why the cross is there, to throw out the rubbish and bring us, to conform us to the image of his Son. Amen? We still friends? You must never have a camera here looking this way and then broadcast it. My goodness me. The faces get more and more serious. Like that. Do you understand me? We're talking about very serious things. Very serious things. We're going to pray. And I want you to search your hearts. It doesn't mean we have an answer today. It means I'm going to leave this place. And what am I going to say? God, help me clean my house. Father, today, we humble ourselves before you. All of us. All of us, me included. Your word is your word. It's not just for the congregation. Your word is for me. Lord, that we would see the value of our souls in your presence and how much you treasure our lives. You treasure us. You, you, we have, there's nothing comparable in your heart to us so much you love us. How it breaks your heart to see us take that which is such a treasure to you and to give it away for the cheap things of the world. Oh Lord, may our hearts come to true repentance. True repentance. Open our eyes. And may we not be afraid to allow the Holy Spirit to have access to the deep issues of our lives where things hide that should not be there. We bought those things. We paid a price for those things with our soul. Father, now, may we take give it back and get back the richness of Jesus Christ until there's a peace and a wholeness in the lives of every one of us. Strengthen every heart and every life here. For we thank you, Father, in the precious name of Jesus.
Amen.